Well, Jack, we're delighted to see you here. Uh, you said you'd never write another book. What made you write this one? Well, I went around the world for the last three and a half years talking to audiences like this and listening to questions. The first book was an autobiography. It was all about me. And this book is trying to codify some things that I learned in business in response to these questions. So this book hopefully is about you and hopefully about audiences and some of the things that people have been challenged by in picking a company to work for, working for a bad boss, so A to Z. The book's called Winning. So what is winning, anyway? I think winning is without question, Bob, defining what your objectives are, clearly laying them out, and then going for it with everything you got and getting there. So one of the things in the book that you're quite outspoken about is candor. You say, uh, let me tell you about the biggest dirty little secret in business, that in every culture, in every country, in every society and social class, there's this lack of candor. Now, why is that so important? Why is it so hard? How do you change that? I think you have to build an, uh, an organization. It, it's, it's quite good in a small startup where people are all comfortable with each other. They know what the mission is. They understand the values. They reward the values. And they go after it with a passion. In a bureaucracy, it tends to get more and more subjected uh, to pressures from the side, from the top, from underneath. People are afraid to speak out. And when it does, it slows you down. It uh, really puts gum in the, we in the gears. And it really uh, doesn't improve the workplace. People aren't being told what, what they're doing well and how they can improve. The evaluation process is not frequent enough. Uh, we get into this, I'm too kind to evaluate my team. This morning I was in, in San Jose with a, about five, 500 executives from startup companies down there and, and some pretty strong tech companies, Intel and others. And I asked the 400 people, how many people thought they had straightforward relationships in their company with their peers and with their associates? I didn't get four hands. Four hands. That's frightening. It's sort of frightening that people are sitting in an organization and don't feel that people are laying it on straight and telling it like this. What was your experience? I was lucky to work for a good company where over time we really developed this honest feedback. But it wasn't that way when I first joined. It takes real it time. Real leadership and commitment. Yeah. And you've got to reward that value. In the end, you get the behaviors you reward. If you reward candor, if you reward straightforward talk, you will get it. If you, on the other hand, don't do that, you'll get close to the best behavior. You've also been outspoken not only on candor, but on differentiation. That part of candor is to be honest with people about where they stand. And you're noted for this top 20, middle 70, bottom 10. Uh, noted is a kind word. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more about differentiation, and uh, shouldn't we be a little tougher on student grading, perhaps? <laughs> well, I think you, I think you probably did a differentiate in school, and you recognize who the top students are, and you recognize where the middle is, and you recognize the bottom. The thing that's crazy is, why is grading and differentiation okay in the fourth grade through? getting an MBA, but it in no way is applicable to adults. It's nuts. Why you would end up having this false kindness where you don't tell people where they stand until you run into trouble. So my view is, take care of the top 20, and this isn't a permanent thing, it changes all the time, but take that top 20, make them feel loved, hug them, give them cash, give them uh, rewards in the soul and the wallet. Do everything for them. That middle 70, show them what they need to do to get in the top 20. And that bottom 10, tell them not that they, why they basically should move on. And don't do it in a guillotine job. Have a conversation that goes over a year or so about what their shortfalls are. Tell them they're in the bottom 10. Don't give them a raise of any kind. Don't give them 2 3 percent, that fake raise that keeps people hanging around. Uh, 
cut off the, the, the salary issue and then ask him to leave and say, let's over the next several months work together to get you in the right place. That's so much better than these crazy situations. Companies in, in the valley here, they run into trouble. What do they do? They're going to cut costs. They, they're going to have a layoff. They walk into people and they say, look, Joe, Mary, we got to cut you, uh, cut you back. We got to take you out. Uh, we need to cut costs now. And they say, why us? And they say, well, you weren't that good. And then they say, but we've been here 12 years and nobody ever told us that. That's what happens in this false kindness thing. People get misled. And then if you do it too late in your career, I maintain that not having the differentiation is the cruelest form of manager. The cruelest thing. If you have responsibility, if you lead people, they should know where they stand. As you go out from school here now, with shiny MBAs, and you go work for somebody, initially it's going to be about you. You'll be a leader. You'll be an individual contributor starring in something, either starting something up or doing something else, but it'll be about you. The day you become a leader, managing five, eight, ten people, it becomes about them. And your future is tied to them. You no longer do the nitty gritty little stuff. You, you build them into great people and you get a kick out of that. And then you get the benefits of their success as you go up. If you keep doing what you started doing when you joined the place, doing your job, your project, rather than building your team, you'll go nowhere in, in, a, in a layered society. In the book, you uh, use candor and differentiation and a few other things, mission and values and a voice and dignity as what you call first principles. You, know, you just got to have this in a company to be successful. Are you surprised at how few organizations really have these first principles? Shocked. I mean, it is mission and values are the most gobbledygook conversation pieces in companies. I mean, a mission statement ought to be so clear. It ought to exactly know where you're going to go, define it clearly, and go after it. Not have this mission of uh, goodness and all these other words that get in like mission statements. Make it very clear what you want to be. And then have the values, which I call behaviors. Values are a misused word. Values are behaviors. The behaviors you want to achieve that mission. And then you measure and reward, as I said, in the soul and the wallet, those behaviors. And when people don't exhibit those behaviors, and you want them, and you finally have to part company with people because they didn't exhibit the behaviors and values you wanted, you can't say that they went home to spend more time with personal time with the family. You've got to say, here's why these people didn't make it. They're good people. They're this and that. But they didn't have our values. One of the craziest things you see in, in, in corporate America, is it's run by lawyers in some ways, where, where you end up with integrity viol uh, violations. And people say, well, we had to let so-and-so go. Uh, they they, they, uh, they want to spend more time at home. You got to say, you got to hang them publicly for doing bad stuff. <laughs> you got to set the tone of your values and your behavior. And you, if you're doing it right, you can't be afraid to put it out there. And so I think that you set a mission, you set the behaviors, you operate in, a, you operate in an open, candid, as you said, takes time, build trust, transparent fashion, and you give every employee voice and dignity, and you've got a foundation that means something. You mentioned trust, and I know in your section and your chapter on leadership, and you know one of the key things, leaders have to earn trust. Nobody gives it to you, you've got to go out and earn it. Uh, do you, I'd like to ask you a, a, a question today with uh, compensation and benefits and stuff. Do you think it's possible that executives can be paid so much that it's really hard for them to win the trust of their people if they don't think it's right or fair? Well, it's, it's, we, we have to lay out clearly what the game is. I mean, we have a free market system. We have capitalism. It has its flaws. There's no way to come to a perfect answer to every single, what the absolute salary ought to be. 
But it ought to be pretty transparent. People ought to know what the opportunities are and, and the opportunities to grow are and, and to get it. And I don't think salary enters into a lack of trust issue. I think if you, now if you've got a jerk boss getting too much more money and not, a, and not building a team, of course you'll have it. But if, if you're building a team together around a common vision, you won't, won't have it. But the whole issue of salary um, and severance and all these things is a big popular subject today. And severance in particular is one that drives everyone crazy. And the problem with severance, is, and we just had one with Kali Fifi Arena here in this area, where she got $22 million for leaving. The problem is not Kali with the $22 million. The problem is the board at Euler Packard that did not, did not have a succession plan in place so that when the existing CEO failed and they threw him out, they had to go out and get somebody and they had to offer them the world to get them. If they had a succession plan, that wouldn't happen. Most of these problems come at the front end of these deals. They, they, they get written up and beat up on the back end but the problem came on the, uh, on the front end. Uh, Tyco, for example, you probably all know about Tyco and Kozlowski and all the mess that they had. They, had, they didn't have a succession plan. So they went to Motorola to get the number two person there, Ed Breen. Now, Ed Breen is not going to go to this tarnished place, this disaster, without a package. Well, they had a back of Brinks truck up to get, <laughs> to get Ed Breen to come there. Now, Ed Breen had, had, had all the negotiating tools because there was nothing there. When, when we had our success session at GE, we had three contenders at the end, Jeff Immel, uh, Bob Nardelli, who went to Home Depot, and Jim McNerney, who went to 3M, all very capable, all equally capable in, in, in many, many ways. Jeff got the job. Bob goes to Home Depot. They didn't have a succession plan. Jim goes to 3M. They didn't have a succession plan. Jim and Bob, Jeff got a raise. Nice going, Jeff. Congratulations, you got a raise. <laughs> Jim and Bob, the trucks were loading the money on the back of the van. Because <laughs> those two companies didn't have succession plans. So my argument is succession plans are the answer to controlling these outrageous severances and these other games where you don't have these deals. Bob was here earlier in the year for a view from the top, and he looked like he was doing well. <laughs> <laughs> you say something in the book that uh, didn't shock me, but it may shock a lot of people, and that is you said, you know, the chief human resources officer is at least, if not more important, than the chief financial officer. And I'll tell you, we're not even close to where we have to be in this area. Uh, <clears throat> Most, unfortunately, I was, in, I was in Mexico giving a talk with my wife, uh, Susie, who, by the way, wrote this book. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm just a mouthpiece in this game. Uh, we were in, Me in Mexico for 5,000, 5,000 HR people were, were there. We asked, a, I asked a question to the audience. Raise your hand if you're perceived by the organization to have a seat at the table equal to the CFO. I didn't get 50 hands. Now, if I asked that question in GE, there isn't one HR person that wouldn't raise their hand. Every one of them knows that they're equal to or more important than somebody counting the numbers. I always like to use the, the, the analogy, if you were coaching a baseball team or a football team, would you want to hang around with a team accountant or the head of player personnel if you wanted to build a great team? The accountant can't do a damn thing for you, except to tell you how much money you got left to offer to Barry Bonds or anybody else. But he can't do much else. The idea that CEOs hang around with the CFO, the grunt, the guy with the green eye shades, is crazy. <laughs> the HR person is the person that if, if they're not doing, most companies may make them the uh, uh, picnics and uh, plant newspaper people and the uh, dental plan fill out the forms. But if they use them right and they build seasoned executives into the, these jobs, they'll be an enormous aid to building great teams. 
And so we, we use the line that great HR ex executives are really pastor in listening to people and parents in disciplining kids. And so there's an, e there's an enormous need to have these HR people be upgraded, be the stars of the org org organization by not having HR professionals in many ways, but taking people that are in line jobs that have a touch and, and go over there. The reason why HR, I'm convinced the re reason why HR is not perceived as a very important function in companies, everybody thinks they're HR experts. How many of you don't think you're a people person? <laughs> okay? I mean, everyone thinks they are. Who, who needs a helper? Is the view. It's wacky. You need somebody that's there. And I'd like to see a Sarbanes-Oxley law that went in that, that would hang to get companies that aren't straightforward with the appraisal process, that have the same rigor around appraising and evaluating people as they do around the financial statement. If I could have my way, they'd have a Sarbanes-Oxley that would apply to that human resource process to put discipline into the company, and you'd get better teams from it. As long as we're on finance, another thing that goes on a lot in the finance industry is merger and acquisition activity. Uh, and you have a chapter on M&A, and among other things, you say that cultural fit is more important than strategic fit. Well, certainly equal to. Or at least as important. Yeah. And that uh, it, but there is no cultural fit side to an investment bank. That's why I, that's what I found out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, I, I, I'm sure a lot of you are going to the Morgan Stanleys and Goldman Sachs and, and, and some of the great firms on Wall Street again. But uh, y you all know, because you're going there, it's. You, you eat what you kill. And um, <laughs> it, it, it's an environment around uh, where the measurement system is really my bonus, my bonus, my bonus. And uh, it's a whole different pattern of behavior than it is in a company that's trying to tra transfer ideas across businesses, has a, a, uh, a, a desire to have boundaryless thinking, is moving people around, around the world to build leaders and not individual contributor stars. It's a whole different culture. but. Back to the, the M&A chapter, uh, Bob, we spent a lot of time going over some of the aspects in M&A. One of the silly things that happened, well, first of all, the, one, one of the big, big sins is deal heat. And we're seeing deal heat right, right now. Money is relatively inexpensive. Look at the, uh, the bidding uh, for MCI. I mean, it might have been a good deal at $6 billion. I don't know how, other than two investment banks trying to make a killing, how it can be a good deal at nine and a half to ten, uh, and and now I don't know where it's it, it's it's going to stop. But this uh, once you get into deal heat, all rationality goes. So we talk about the the deadly sins of mergers and acquisitions. First one is deal heat. Young investment bankers like you will will be driving poor dumb CEOs to do some of the stupidest things in the world when they get into deal heat, and. And the challenge is to kick you out as it gets too hot. Not Stanford MBA. No, no. <laughs> so, and, and, and we talk a lot about uh, the conqueror syndrome, where you go in and you, you have all the answers and you throw out all, all the knowledge that was there because the, 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 the conqueror wins. We talk about, uh, for, for, for the acquired person, the dumbest thing acquired people ever do is when somebody buys the firm they're at, they pout about the deal, and they resist. Let me tell you, if you spend billions of dollars for a company and you show up to see the new people, and they're just giving you a sour face and a resistance look, people will, will keep positive buy-in people with average IQ a lot more than they'll keep resistors with brains. It's a crazy syndrome, but it happens all the time. The resistors are not an attractive bunch in the takeover process. You've seen that in companies you've been involved in. So we've got a chapter here in Winning that, that deals with uh, all the personal elements, seven deadly sins and the, of M&A in, in, the, in the book. You also have a chapter on a subject that's very much 
on the hearts and minds of our students. That is called the right job. And you say, a great job can make your life exciting and give it meaning. The wrong job can drain the life right out of you. So how do we get the great jobs, right? That's what people want to know. Page 257. <laughs> we have a grid with five, five clear-cut things to think about. One is people. When you look for, for a job, be sure you look for people that are like you. They laugh at the jokes you, you laugh at. They think the way you think. Uh, they have the same sensibilities. If you're a nerd, go hang out with nerds. But don't end up confusing the issue. Never have to put, put on a persona to be in the job you pick. Uh, as far as uh, opportunities are concerned, Always go to a company where there are smarter people around you than, than you, where you can learn, where you can grow. Don't go to a place where you're going to be the smartest person in the place. It doesn't do much for, for you. Now, I'm, I'm all for, for, for startups and, and, and entrepreneurs, and that may be right there if you've got the idea and you've got the vision and you're going after it, and I applaud that totally. But if you're going to a company, that's worthwhile. Options are the third thing we talk about. If you're going to a company... Uh, and you're not sure exactly what's right, I would go to a company that has a brand. A brand counts. Uh, whether it's Microsoft, J&J, &J, you, you, you pick the company. Wells Fargo, you pick the company. You pick a company that has a brand because if things aren't right for you in your first job, your brand will be very important as you look to the next job. And people in the chemical industry, we used to always want, want to hire people from DuPont. They probably weren't any smarter than anybody else, but we thought they were. And the same thing's true of Microsoft. People out here want, want to get a Microsoft person. Yeah, they probably have a pot full of duds, but nevertheless, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a wonderful, it, it's another one of those chits you have. Um, you, you can ask Palmer when, when he comes here. Um, Whether he has a pot full of duds. duds. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, but, ha but having options based on the brand is, is important. Uh, the, the uh, fourth one is um, ownership. Own the company you're going to. Don't take a responsibility for the job, job you take. Don't blame it on somebody else. My mother wanted me to always live here. Uh, I've got a spouse and I can't travel. If, you, if that's the case, make that deal going in knowing it. But don't then come home and kick the dog or punch the wall because that, that's what's happening. And finally, work content. Be sure the work turns your crank. Don't go to the job for an extra 10 bucks or 15 bucks or whatever the num number is. Go to the job because the work turns your crank. Really turns you on, excites you every day. That's what you got to look for. You can't go to one because it's, well, it's a job for now as I look for another one. Uh, it, the, mo the money is good. I don't like to work, but I, but I want some money for a while before I get work I like. I mean, those things don't work. So I think this grid is worth... I, I gave this grid to my, to my radiologist doctor because I've had some back problems and I wanted to play golf, and he gives me needles uh, with steroids to try and get the back to calm down. <laughs> so um, I gave him the page 257, and uh, he's got his lead apron on, and he's giving me the shots, and he's saying... Jesus, I gotta get out of here. He said, <laughs> he said, I don't like any of these things that I'm doing. I don't like the people, I don't like the work. <laughs> you also have a chapter on a subject that's uh, very important to a lot of our students, and that's work life balance. And you say, look, you can get it, but you have to earn it. Yeah, I think it's without question, Bob. I, they're, they're a company, you want to be in a family fr a friendly company, that's for sure. Uh, but I do think the, the work life balancing is not in a company brochure. That's a recruiting tool. What it really is, it's an old fashioned chit system. You over deliver, you make your boss look good, you put chits in the bank. When you need flexibility, where, whether it be for ballet or whether it be for yoga or whether it be for kids or whether, whatever, whatever it is, you pull the chits back out. But it is an old-fashioned chit system. And those that are stars and those that deliver get fl earn flexibility. 
and it's something that is clearly earned. And it's not something that is handed to you at the beginning of a game. We, we, we tell this story in the book of this job where a friend, a friend of ours was r running a small operation, 60 people. One of the women in the job had a second child. She had been in the company eight years. She was a real star. She came in and said, look, I, I want to work at home on Fridays and Mondays and come in the office th th three days a week. Is that OK? And they said, absolutely. You, you're doing a great job. You're doing it fine. And they, they let her do it. Immediately, down the hall, Prances, this young man, six months out of uh, school. And he says, I'd like to get Friday off and Monday off. And uh, the boss said, why? He said, I want to practice, perfect my yoga practice. And the boss, she said, no, no way. And he said, you mean to say you're making a judgment and you're, and you're not qualified, I'll tell you that right now, to make a judgment between motherhood is more valuable than my yoga practice. You have no right to do that. And she said, I'm not making that judgment. I'm making the judgment that you haven't earned a thing in the six months you've been here. Therefore, you don't get the flexibility. You're barely doing your job now. <laughs> so that's the way it's always going to be. It's you deliver, you get flexibility. You don't, if every time your boss has a report or needs something, desperately wants to get it, and you say, I can't be there, things aren't going to go right for you. You've got to find the systems that allow you to over-deliver and then earn flexibility. Jack, obviously you learned about management by doing it. I mean, you were a manager and you learned about leadership by taking on a management and leadership role. But since you've left that active life, how much just talking about it and going around to places like this, do you think, have you learned more by having to reflect on it, write books, or not really? Oh, Bob, I mean, you, this is a lot easier to reflect back on as to how it works than when you're doing it. Doing it is a bunch of chaotic steps. It now looks neat. <laughs> but I mean, doing it are a series of trials and errors. Uh, trial this is codifying everything I know. I think I, I've learned more in the last three years than I learned in the first 40 at work. Really? Just by understanding what I did or what we did, how people responded, what worked and didn't work. I mean, when, when you're doing it, you're in the battlefield. Uh, shrapnel's coming from all sides. You, you're not thinking through a lot of these moves. I think hopefully this book will give people some insights that can be useful. I mean, I, uh, I'm a lot smarter writing it today than I was when I started. So I, I'm, I'd say the, I've learned a hell of a lot now. Um, thank you very much for being here again. Really appreciate it. Um, a question that we've been debating in the Government and Politics Club was actually raised by Obama and the duds, I guess, at Microsoft. No, that, um, don't overstate that case. I said yeah. they, they may have a few duds in the middle of all of Microsoft. We Just won't kidding. misquote you, Jeff. Just kidding. Um, so one of the, the issues, they recently pulled back their support for this bill to, for gay rights, I guess, in the state of Washington. And so the question he raised, and which I'd like to hear your view on, is how involved or where do you draw the line as a corporation in social policy? And what's your view on the involvement of corporations in social policy that may not directly relate to their b business, per se? You know, my view, and, and don't, don't forget I'm from a different era, my view was clearly that you stayed out of that that you didn't get involved in government social policy, and that GE stayed 18 miles away from it during my time. time there. I don't think it's our business, uh, right? I, our job is to be competitive, provide valued uh, products and services that create jobs, and create an environment where people can grow and flourish. That was our job, and to be non-discriminatory, but not to go to Tell gov to involve ourselves in government po policy re regarding those things, social policy. Next. Yep, thanks. So here at the business school, we are given a lot of models and a lot of ideas, and we spend a lot of time thinking and talking about what we would do if we were in certain situations or with certain information. One of the things that still bothers me a bit that I'm hoping you can shed some light on is 
when you're out working, it's my at least past experience that you're overwhelmed with information, that it's not given to you in a, you know, these are the three things you ought to think about, so pick a model to put it into. And if you can shed some light for us on how you take maybe a thousand pieces of information, find the five that are valuable to make a decision as a manager, and then then we can apply the, you know, whatever model we have to those five. Well, I, let, let, let me just start out by saying, the day you go to work will be the last time you'll think about a model, I think. <laughs> okay? I, I mean, <laughs> you will be involved in real life situations <clears throat> where your, <clears throat> excuse me, where your pattern recognition will come, come into play, where, where all of your experiences uh, will build and build and build to where when you see something, you'll act. Or you'll say, for example, the real estate boom is going like this, and you'll drive into a town and you'll see 50 cranes everywhere. And some cherubic kid will be in, not you, but somebody five years from now will be in pitching you on and one more real, just one more building. And you'll say, look, I've seen this before. These things don't grow to the sky. There's way, there's over capacity now, and there's cranes as far as I can see. That'll be more valuable insight to you than any of the models you study. And you'll say, get out of here. We've done enough in this segment, in this cycle. Let's get them on the downside. When vacancies are high, we can buy at a third on the dollar. And, and so you'll give a whole series of life experiences where your pattern recognition will come into play. You'll meet people in the interviewing pro, uh, process. You'll do X percent the first three or four, four years of hiring. You'll get better and better. You'll never get perfect, but you'll spot a phony better. You'll, 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 you'll understand that degrees mean one thing, but the day after they show up, degrees mean nothing. It's really what they can deliver. So all these things will come to you from that. And I, as far as being over deluged in data, I, I never found that to be a problem. I, I always found you know, you're always short of data. You're really always short of knowing the final answer. That's why you've got to go. And you can't wait for all the data. I mean, anybody could make the decision in hindsight. So you have to go with your gut based on the experience, life experiences you have had to hire, to invest, to fire, all those things. Thanks. We have a question over here. Dr. Welch, um, what is most important to you and why? <laughs> You realize, Jack, that's a question we ask all of our students that are admitted. What's most, what matters most to you and why? I think it changes in, in time. If I were here at this point in time, getting a job and, pay, and paying off the loan would be highly important. <laughs> okay? uh, <clears throat> at my stage in life, teaching, learning, and money is not important. So teaching and learning is absolutely critical to me. Uh, I love the learning process. Uh, I love the, being a better family per person than I ever was when I was working. Uh, so, so there's a lot to give back here. I like giving back. I teach uh, principals in, in the New York City school system. I was never going to go teach inner city uh, uh, principals in New York City when, when I was in my day job. And today I do that. I love doing it. So uh, I, mean, I think things change. I, I don't think at any one moment in time, uh, I think at any one moment in time, you, you can have the answer. But as you go forward, hopefully, things will change. So I, I don't have a particular uh, thing now other than learning and teaching and giving back. Where's Derek? Should we admit him or not? I had a question around sort of the ethical problems we've seen in a lot of corporate America. And my question for a senior executive like you is, is GE's ability to stay out of those problems based on, you know, each executive reflecting on what sort of decisions they want to make before they become into situations that could be gray zones? Or is it more about setting up systems around you and people around you to help you make the right decisions? Uh, clearly the latter. Uh, you couldn't have 350,000 people without systems. And you don't have the perfect 350,000 people. Uh, but you have pro you don't see 
old wine companies getting in fundamental trouble because they've done everything wrong over the last hundred years. <laughs> and there's a system. When, when I joined GE, the first six months I was there, I was quizzed constantly about price fixing because GE had come off a price fixing case in the 50s. So policies were in place. We'll never do a price fix, I don't think, again, because we've all been trained and we got 18 ways to catch it. In the 80s, when, when I was CEO and Cap Weinberger was going through the $400 hammer and the, and the toilet seat that cost $600, et cetera, and they had a big fraud, waste, and abuse thing, we had a time card mess. And uh, some guys were, were putting projects on one thing versus another project down in the organization. And we had a fine, and it was a big scene. We'll never have one of those again. I mean, I, we may have one, but it won't get any, any size, because we got 18,000 policies and quizzes and tests to go through to solve them. So process is what happened. If, if you go back to the Enron and the Arthur Anderson cases, this is a classic case of what can go wrong. Uh, Enron, a good pipeline company, got energy from point A to point B, had good processes in place, but it was boring. <laughs> so they decided to go into trading, and they get the slick back MBAs with the suspenders and the whole program, and they go out and start trading electrons, first energy, then electrons, and everything else, and, and, then, and then broadband. They start trading. But there was no culture to take care of that. There was no rules of the road. There was no processes. Arthur Anderson. Arthur Anderson used to be green eye shade grunts for a hundred years. They were a great accounting firm. There wasn't enough money in accounting. So they entered consulting in the 80s. And you're all familiar with what's now Accenture, but that was a piece of Arthur Anderson on the consulting side. They actually ended up in court in the 90s over dividing the profits between the two branches, accounting and consulting. Now, when you got that that system in, in a company, how can you have values and, and processes to control what was going on? They were chasing the money. So breakdowns come when massive cultural changes occur or when there are no systems in place because co companies are started like WorldCom from a uh, motel in Hattiesburg, Mississippi with then a, a, a bunch of small acquisitions. No integration, no processes. So, now, the answer to your question is clearly the latter point you made. Companies have to test. I mean, in GE now, for example, there are online tests that people have to pass to go to the be, 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 before they can go to the next job. It's all about integrity and violations, the gray areas that might occur. So companies got to spend a lot of time and rigor to rig that out of the system. We have a big queue here. Let's work it down a little bit. Next, from the left wing here. Jack, uh, growing up as a kid, the, the big thing we heard about GE was GE, we bring good things to life. Since you've left, the motto has changed to GE, imagination at work. I guess the question to you is, what does that really mean, and how do you see that fitting in with the direction of the company? Look, I think that they, what they looked at was, <clears throat> based on my best understanding, they looked at, we bring good things to, uh, things to life, and it looked like it was your father's program. And <laughs> imagination at work, uh, convinced some ad kid that that was more young, youthful. So, new, new team, new eyes, new slogan. Uh, nothing wrong with that. That's a view that they have now of going after. That's what change is all about. And it's supposed to be a more exciting, uh, forward-looking uh, image for the company. But that's, you know, we'll see. What, what, what really matters is is the company delivering, and they are now. We've just had a great quarter, we've had a great year, and, uh, and, I, and I don't think whether the slogan changes or not is, uh, is critical. But I'm, you know, I'm totally supportive of it. Thank you. You've referred several times today to giving people rewards of the wallet and rewards of the soul. I'm wondering if you could speak a bit about how as a manager you thought about motivating people by giving them the right combination of rewards that would work for them. Yep. I would, <clears throat> here's one of the problems. If, if, if you ask managers tomorrow, if you, you all went around and did a survey of middle managers and top managers, you would, and you asked the question, do you celebrate enough? You would be shocked. 
and how everyone would say, no, not here, we never saw it, you know, it never happens. Uh, one of the things you can do as managers when, when you go out is have small celebrations for every little victory on the way to reaching your vision. Uh, excite people, give them better jobs, send them off to training, do things for them that aren't particularly right on the button monetary, but they're recognition. And you've got to do that, as, but again, plaques don't substitute for checks. And so you've got to have a combination of checks and plaques. And uh, you can't, and you can't, do, in investment banking it's mainly checks. But in most co corporations, people try and get that balance right. And recognition, awards, patents, all that stuff can be big celebrations. And I think that's the job of the manager, to, make, to come up with that balance that feels right for your team, that turns them on. But the, go ahead, follow up. And how can you figure out what's right for your team, given that each of us would have a different answer to what matters most because to us? Because I can't give you the, the, the concrete answer. You, you, your question just raised it. Each of you will have a different view. Your job is to sense that. Thing. Remember, the day you become a leader, it becomes about them, right? If it becomes about them, your job is to walk around with a can of water in one hand and a can of fertilizer in the other hand. And think of your team as seeds and try and build a garden. Now, you'll end up with some weeds, and you're going to have to cut out some weeds. <laughs> but that's your job. It's about building these people you know, in my case, if, if, if they were dealing with me, they'd want to make me feel 6'4 with hair. And that's what you're going to want to try and do. You're going to try and do that with your team. And, and only you will know the team. Some people will be more motivated by this. Some will be more motivated by this. But you'll be the, if you will, the orchestra conductor that will bring it all together. And I can't tell you what mix of what is the right answer. I know one thing. Money counts. It's important. It's an important part of the mix. And people get all caught up too much in the plaque and the other stuff. You can't leave that out, but I would err a little on the, on the monetary side of the reward system. Dr. Welsh, I've admired your managerial um, leadership for a long time, so it's an honor to have you here. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. When you spoke about getting our the right job for us, the, your first point, which I really loved, is to go somewhere where we feel comfortable, where people would laugh at the same kinds of jokes that we would. My concern about that is that research tells us that we feel most comfortable around people who are similar to us, be it in gender or race or nationality or socioeconomic background. How do we... Um, maintain comfort but also push ourselves to places where we can learn from a diverse environment and you know, learning from people who are different than us? It's a great question. I mean, no, but you, you wouldn't want to go to a place where you couldn't be yourself. I don't think you want to reflect, you don't want to mirror on any, any, everyone you, you look at looking like you. I think you do, though, want to be in a place. We, we tell a story in the, in the book, and I'll now confess it's Susie. Uh, we talk about this woman who went to look for a job, and she was looking at consulting firms at the time. She was uh, I'm thinking of getting her MBA from the other school on the East Coast. And um, she showed up at this place, and she came to this one place, and the three people were waiting at the top of the stairs, and she walked in, and she fell and did a face plant like that. And she said, hi, I'm Gracie the ballerina, uh, the ballet teacher. And the three of them looked at her like this, you know, what are you, weird? Uh, at the end of the day, they gave her an offer, and another consulting firm gave her an offer. She was much more comfortable going to place that she didn't look weird with a, fun, with a line which I think is funny, and she thought was funny. Hi, I'm Grace, the ballet teacher, as she did a face plan. And they were quite serious and stiff about the whole event, and it didn't feel like a very good place to hang out. Both consulting firms were great, uh, top three, and uh, why not go with the place you wanted to be? I don't think it, re it relates to, to, to a personal style as much as just sensibilities. If the sensibilities are the same, like you, if, if, if you're somebody that likes to have fun, relax a lot, work like hell, but have fun doing it, and you go with a bunch of pompous stiffs, that's never going to be any fun for you. And, and, and they can be all different shapes and colors. 
That isn't the issue, it's the sensibilities. With so much external praise for your management style, how do you evaluate yourself and what failures or shortcomings do you think you have in your career and what have you done about it? Yeah, I was probably too quick triggered early on. I probably hired people um, on some superficial characteristics. You know, uh, good looking and Stanford MBA, that's generally a pretty good package. <laughs> and, uh, and that may or may not be any good after a while, okay? And so, uh, these are things that you learn. Uh, I, um, I, at times in my career, I thought I was too big for my britches, and I made some bad acquisitions because I thought I could buy anything and it would all work out. Um, I think you just, you constantly reinvent yourself. You know what you were when you, the question that was first asked, what do you want to be? You know, it's going to change. And you're going to get smarter as you go along. You're going to learn so much. You're going to laugh at how little you know now, five years from now. And that's the way you've got to see it. It's OK. I know so much more about how managers think and how they feel and, and what frustrates them now than I did when I was CEO. So I think you're going to constantly be learning and evaluating, and making mistakes, adapting your style. And people say, oh, God, he's changed. Oh, thank, thank God you've changed. The whole world's changed. I mean, if you, haven't, if you don't change with it, I'm not saying change every day, but you certainly want to move from a learning experience to a new platform and behavior that, that, that you picked up because of experience. You had mentioned the importance of uh, differentiation in, uh, in, in a company that that aims to be successful, and uh, you made an analogy with academic settings. And it, it seems to me that the difference is that uh, if I choose to be as, as competitive and cutthroat as I want in an academic setting, uh, the only potential it has for harm is that it might hurt me because I don't build relationships. If I do that in a company setting because I'm trying to get ahead, uh, it undermines your value of of, you're of dead candor. if you do that. In a company that, that's got any values, you're, you're dead. You're more dead there than you are in school. In school, you can do it and get grades and, and take a lousy personality and go out. <laughs> in, in, in a company, your peers will eat you alive and spit you out. That's what will happen with that behavior. So the idea of differentiation causing a lack of teamwork is the silliest anti-argument in the world. And it's brought up all the time. How do you think teams win? Do you think the Yankees pay the second baseman uh, the same as they pay Alex Rodriguez? And yet, as a team, they win. The idea of, of, output, of high performers and low performers not being able to work, a medium performers not being able to work, work together, if you set the behaviors you want, if you say cutthroat behavior, no sharing of ideas is, is a killer in your culture. You, get, you won't get it. If you allow it in your culture, you'll get it. That's where we're back to values. You set the values and the behaviors. But now I'll let you finish your question. <laughs> well, as, as, as a manager, how do you keep track of who's doing what? How do you know which people are being cutthroat and which people are just doing their job? You mean all, all of your own people? All of your own people. Right. You mean 10 people and you don't know? Yeah, that's your job. <laughs> I mean, that is fundamentally the job you are going to have. If you've got a horse's ass there doing bad things and you let it go on, you'll disintegrate your whole team. But that's why you're being paid. They gave you that job to figure that out. No, seriously, I mean, that's really what your job is. I don't mean to be aggressive here, but that's what's what your job is. <laughs> I was uh, hoping you could share some insight into how you manage your own time, particularly when you were heading a large company. I'm sure everybody wants a piece of the CEO. Everybody wants to talk with the chairman. Um, no, I, I, I knew what my job was. I really understood that my job was not managing to find a new comedy build a jet engine, uh, build a medical scanner. It was in, it's an impossible job. But I knew my job was building people. 
building talent. And I came to work every day thinking about the people process and thinking about evaluations. When I went to factories, I sat down with the union and talked with them about how things were going, more to find out what the atmosphere in the place was than to find out the specific, specific grade. So my job, if, if we didn't build all these leaders, that now we have 35 or so, four, Fortune 500 CEOs, and four of the Dow Jones 30, if we didn't do that, we would have failed. Because my job was not coming up with a Seinfeld com comedy or an apprentice show or any of these things. My job was to get somebody to run that place who could come up with those things. So my time was, I'd say, 65 to 75 percent on that. I had three things I had to do. I had to pick people. I had to allocate resources based on what the people were selling me, eyeball to eyeball. And I had to transfer good ideas, generic ideas across the business. That's all I did. I didn't have any pricing power, any design issues, uh, any of those things. I knew my job. And so I allocated most of my time to people. Thanks. Dr. Welsh, um, I have a question on the appraisal system, yep. um, specifically the grading curve we talked about. And you mentioned earlier that you spent a lot of time just doing whatever to keep the top 20%. Then the next, the middle 70%, you kind of tell them how to get to be the top 20%, and at the bottom 10%, you kind of help them out, but help them out as well. Um, what I struggle with is that it seems to be a zero-sum game. The moment you put it uh, in relative terms, the 70, middle 70% cannot make it to the top 20% without someone in the top 20% falling out into the middle 70%. Um, in terms of the actual application of this system, is there, is it, does it work because G is so large? Because if you try to, to uh, implement it in a small enough division or unit, you actually may lose a lot of good people. No, but aren't, aren't you raising the bar all the time? Yes. Okay. Tell me a better system to raise the bar of, of, of the group. Give me an alternative. This is one I've got that I think is the best I've come up with. I don't say it's the only one. It's one I believe is better. Now, you tell me a better one to get a better team. Well, I believe that the relative system is a good one. But what I'm, what I'm uncomfortable with is that the bottom 10%, even if they have improved in absolute terms, we still be asked to leave. Is, is it not that rigid in, in practice? Oh, it's not. I mean, you, you have, you're not down there with a fine-tooth comb. This is all directional. But clearly, you want to get the. You don't want to spend a lot of time. It's like ha, 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 having the, the the bad egg on the play, playground. You don't want to spend your time trying to take somebody that's not very good, and you want to make take great people and make them unbelievably great. That's what your job is. If you waste time trying to get somebody over the bottom ten threshold, you'll be spending a lot of energy on something that's not very productive. And they can, and they'll do fine elsewhere if you do it early enough in their careers. So, so I just think it's the best way to do it. I, I, but I, I would never sit here and say, this is the only way. And you can get everybody saying, I don't like this because a, a, after I do it twice, I've already gotten rid, rid of the weak people now, and now I've got a perfect team. That's not true because what will happen is you'll get promoted because you'll have a great team. And if you don't keep doing it, somebody else is going to come into your job. And they're going to say, what, and what is your, your name? What is your name? Don. Don. So they're going to take Don. Don got promoted. He went to another place. And in they come to Don's job. And they're, going to, well, and, and they're going to look at the people, OK? They're going to look at the people. And they're going to say, and they're going to do a top 20, middle 70, bottom 10. And they're going to say, my god, how did he keep that person? So you're not doing anybody any favors because fresh eyes will look at it differently every time. And so I just think it's the best way to build a team. But I do not say it's the only way to build a team. I found it to be a clear cut. It forced evaluations. It forced people to stop winking at people. It was transparent. And people knew they got a fair shake. One of the things you, that you'll find in a company, somebody does a great job. And, and you say, let's give them something for doing that great job. You'll have this incredible experience. They'll say, the guy will say, I can't. I, I don't want to make the, the others feel bad. 
Well, if you can't identify what they did and justify the great thing they did by rewarding them, you shouldn't do it. But if you, if you can do it, you should do it and make it transparent as can be. It doesn't mean the others can't get something someday for something. But this idea of leveling everything, it's like the companies that give 100 or 500 stock options to everyone. It's the dumbest game in town. It's like having a dental plan. I mean, what do you gain if everybody gets it? There's, there's no evaluation. There's no differentiation. People, people know who's, who's ca ca carrying the freight, and they know who is not carrying the freight. In, in our company, for example, despite this system, after seven years, the top people thought we were tough enough on weak performers. 90 plus percent of the blind sur surveys that we were. As we went down in the organization, there was a massive complaint that we weren't tough enough on weak performance. The people closest to the work know who's pulling the, the oars on the boat. And so they're mad as hell when somebody comes in two hours late and they have to cover for them and do this and that. So the idea of being rigorous is something that absolutely increases the morale of a company. It does not decrease the morale of a company. No one likes a company or a unit that carries along. Just think of the rowboat. Four on each side. Two aren't working on one side. What happens to the boat? It goes right around in circles. And everyone in the organization knows who's carrying the freight. Your job is to find out as much as they know. So I, I like it. It's the best system I've ever found. We built great teams. And the proof is the enormous number of leaders that we built from that system. I don't see another one, another system delivering that many leaders. Thank you. I think that one of your uh, parts of your legacy would be what you left behind and your successor. Can you shed a little light on what went into your decision when you went left with very capable people at the end? Yeah, it's back to the question we got asked earlier. You got all this data. A feeling, a smell, a confirmation by a board that took seven years to come up with the answer. Um, a lot of times, seeing a lot of different situations, we made a call. We couldn't have gone wrong on either one, of, on any one, one of the three. Couldn't have gone wrong. And we made a call to the best of our, our ability. And so far, he's making us look very good. But I don't have a specific, just a gut, a feel. And so do they have a gut and a feel. But the other two, I mean, somebody in some other group could have come in and picked any, any one of the three. We couldn't have lost under any circumstances because we spent all our time building that team. See, the interesting thing is that was our job. These companies that end up with no successes and they got to go outside, they had failed in their fundamental job. The boards failed, the CEOs failed. That's a big, massive failure. Getting your successor for the last six years was the biggest thing on my mind. But it, there's no precise, did he make a deal? Bob Nardelli, who, who was here talking to you, had by far the best financial results in GE. By far, not by a little bit, by far. And, and he, he still has trouble. He may, he may even said it here. He, he, he clearly does. <laughs> he still has trouble on saying, why not me? Yeah. I had the best numbers. And I said to him, I can't tell you why. Thanks. <laughs> One more. Last question. Earlier this year, we heard from an, three senior G executives who'd been very successful in their career. And from their conversations with us, it was clear that they had to make some serious family sacrifices along the way to get to where they were. And so while the opportunities for maybe balance were there, it didn't appear that they took them up. So I was wondering, from a leadership perspective, whether you think it's the organization's responsibility to, to deal with that, or whether it's more up to the individual. I think this is an individual call. Bob's balance, my balance, your balance, might not look like balance. Any one of the others looking at it, but I think this is something that each person has to come to grips with themselves. Uh, 
I don't think an organization can make a balanced decision for you. I just don't think so. I think you've got to decide what your priorities are, what, what's important to you, and, and be comfortable with those priorities. And this may be not politically correct, but the organization's job is to win. The organization, winning companies are the only thing that count. Losing is of no value to anybody. It, winning companies pay taxes, they give back. G had 45,000 mentors teaching kids in the inner city schools. Do you think those dot coms up here had, had mentors? They were hanging on for dear life, finally selling the furniture, okay? <laughs> they, that does no good for anyone. So a company's job is to provide opportunity, give you a fair meritocracy, and give you a chance. Your job is to choose your lifestyle, what you want, don't want, how, how much of this you want, how much of that you want. It is not the company, the share owner's job to figure out your balance. That's something you've got to do. Now, that may not be politically correct, but that's the way it is. And only winning companies count. And get all this other stuff out of your mind if you've got any of it into it. That, that anything other than winning counts in companies. Because they give job security, they give employees that give back, they give satisfied lives. People can choose balance or not balance in those companies. But their job is to win and create valued products and services that allow the institution to go forward. Remember, companies are the only thing that drive the society. Successful companies. Government creates no revenues. They get it all from your taxes and companies' taxes. And then they do good things. They defend us in war. They have judicial systems. They educate us. They do all those things. But they do it from no income. They only do it from successful companies. So successful companies are the engine of the society. Government is the support to that. And, the sa and that's why a company's job is delivering winning products happy, successful people, but they've got to decide how much they want to give here, there, or everywhere. Jack, thanks so much for sharing your time and your wisdom and insights. The book is winning. There'll be a book signing in Upper Arbuckle. And the money goes to charity. That's right. Please join me in thanking Jack West. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Bob. <laughs>